Hi guys, it's me. Welcome back to another episode of George Reads. I'm recording this a bit earlier than usual because I'm staying up late tonight to watch a musical. But that doesn't really matter. But yesterday I did a video on reading chapter one of Boom. And in it, Jimbo's sister Becky told Jimbo that his teachers were thinking of sending him to a private school in Fenham, which sounds awful. But Jimbo doesn't quite believe her yet. So tonight we're continuing on from that chapter with chapter two. Are you guys excited? Because I am. So without further ado, let's start. Chapter two, bad things. The atmosphere of supper was not good. Becky told mum it was my sandwich. Mum tore me off for wasting good food. Becky said wasting food wasn't the point. The point was dropping on Craterface. So mum said you could drop a piano on Craterface and it wouldn't make much difference. At this point, Becky swore and stopped off to her room. To remember as worse, Dad forgot to take her the kitchen out of the freezer. He'd forgotten to buy more washing up liquid. And he was sulking about his helicopter, which was lying in the hall, burned, broken and covered with bits of dog do. I still need a toy, insisted Mum, halfway through yesterday's leftover lasagna. It is not a toy, shouted Dad. It got very noisy at this point, so I slipped up to the kitchen and earned some brownie points by doing the washing up. Unfortunately, I had to use the lemon-flavoured soap from the bathroom, which made everything taste funny for the next few days. When I'd finished, I went to the balcony for some peace and quiet. Dad joined me five minutes later. He leaned on the railings beside me and gazed out into the darkness. Life's a cow patch sandwich, Jimbo, he sighed. With very thin bread and a lot of filling. You can mend the helicopter, I reassured him. Yeah, he said, I know. Then he went all sad and silent. I knew what was going to happen. We were going to have one of those conversations about how he didn't feel like a real man anymore. I wouldn't know what to say. He'd tell me to work hard at school because I needed good exam results and nothing was worse than being employed. I didn't want one of those conversations. Not now. I particularly didn't want to think about school and exam results and jobs. I don't know how you lot put up with me, he ploughed on mournfully. I can't cook, I can't clean, I forget the shopping and mope around the house all day. You'll get another job, I said. And anyway, I think lasagna is much nicer than chicken. He laughed and stared out into the dark. After a minute or two, I found myself thinking about the school thing. Mr. Kidd and Venom and the bars on the windows and the howling. Dad? I asked. What? I wanted to tell him how worried I was, but it didn't seem fair. He had enough on his plate, and the possibility that I was going to be expelled wasn't going to cheer him up. Oh, nothing, I said vaguely. Look, I've got to go and do some stuff. Sure, he ruffled my hair. Catch a little partner. I grabbed my jacket, slipped out the front door, and headed down the stairs. Becky had to be lying. She was telling the truth and she was being helpful. Warning me what was going on. Giving me a chance to pull my socks up. And Becky had never been helpful in her entire life. Plus, she had a noble prize in winding people up. Last year, I went to a hospital to have a squint in my eye put right. Before I went in, she kept telling me about all the things that could go wrong. The anaesthetic might not work. I'd be lying there, wide awake, unable to move. Watching them cutting my eye open. They might give me too little oxygen and damage my brain. They might mix me up with someone else and amputate my leg. I was so terrified that I was wheeled into the operating theatre, holding a large piece of paper on which I'd written, Please make sure I am properly asleep. The nurses thought it was hilarious. On the other hand, I did muck about in class. I was in detention every other week. And I was not Albert Einstein. In fact, getting chucked out of school would be pretty much par for the course. Everything seemed to have gone wrong over the past six months. It wasn't just Dad losing a job. It was Mum getting a job that paid double whatever he'd earned at the car plant. She did a part-time business course at the College of Further Education, came top and ended with a job at Perkins of Thingamy in town. So, Dad, so while Dad slouched around all day feeling sorry for himself, circling job adverts in the paper and gluing bits of balsa wood together. 
Mum zipped back and forth on a new red Volkswagen, dressed in natty suits and carrying a briefcase with a combination lock. Some days it seemed as if the whole world had been turned upside down. In ten minutes, I was standing in front of Charlie's house. It was a big post job, four stories, garage and actual drive. Dr Brooks, Charlie's dad, was a short, wiry man with monumental eyebrows. He spoke as little as possible. He worked as a police surgeon. He was the guy you see on the TV, standing out of the dead body, saying he was killed by a blow to the head with a crowbar at approximately 4am. Mrs Brooks, Charlie's mum, was completely different. She was a professional cook who did wedding receptions and conference banquets. She had a kitchen the size of an aircraft hangar and a fridge the size of our fr- flat. She had a temper like a flamethrower and talked pretty much constantly. I walked from the gate and up to the front door, wondering why someone had ripped up the flower bed. I was about to ring the bell when I heard a fake owl hoot from above my head. I looked up and saw Charlie leaning out of his bedroom window. He pressed his finger to his lips and pointed round the side of the house. I kept my trap shut and followed the direction of his finger. As I stood in the dark passage next to the garage, Charlie's other window creaked open and I saw a rope ladder fall towards me. Come up, whispered Charlie. I started to climb, trying very hard not to fall off or put my foot through a window. What's all this about? I asked, sitting on his bed and getting my breath back. I'm grounded, he explained, rolling the rope ladder back up again. Level ten. No going out, no friends over, no TV, nothing. What for? I decided it was time for dry- time I learned to drive, he said. Why? Driving is a very useful skill to have, Jimbo, he said, turning on the radio to cover the sound of our conversation. It seemed like a good idea to start early. So I took the keys from the football and got Mum's car out of the garage while she was at the hairdressers. Did a bit of first gear and first hopper down the drive, then it all went a bit pear-shaped. Let me guess, I said. You drive into their flower bed. Smash the headlight too, said Charlie. I am seriously not in Mum's good books at the moment. We lay around for half an hour, reading old copies of Police Surgeons Weekly that Charlie had nicked from his dad's study looking for pictures of really bad industrial accidents. Then I finally got round to telling Charlie what had been bugging me all evening. I'm in trouble. Join the club, he said. No, I insisted. I mean, big trouble. Tell me. So I told him. He was always the right person to talk about stuff like this. He listened properly and thought hard, and when he said something, it was usually pretty pretty sensible. Charlie looked like a Victorian chimney sweep. Pointy face, speedy eyes, hair going in all directions. Clothes a couple of sizes too large. Not that you really notice him. He didn't say much in class and he avoided fights in the playground. He was the person who was always leaning against a wall in the background, keeping his eye on things. You know something, Jimbo, he said when I had finished my story. What? You are one gullible prat. If your sister told you that the sky was going to fall down, He'd go around wearing a crash helmet. But I was feeling about it. It could be true, couldn't it? I mean, it's possible, right? Well, he said, there's only one thing to do. We have to find out what your teachers really think of you. He wandered over to the far side of the room, shoved the bed aside, lifted a loose floorboard and extracted a small black object from the hole. What's that? I asked. What's what? A walkie-talkie, he replied, and it's going to solve this problem once and for all. How? I asked. Charlie flicked a switch on the walkie-talkie, and I heard his mum's voice talking out of the speaker. I don't care what you say, that boy has got to learn his lesson. This week he's trying to drive the car, next week he'll be burning the house down. Next, he'll be... Now, what do you fancy for supper? I've got some of the trout left over from the Kenyanson's wedding. I can rustle up some new potatoes and green beans. Charlie flicked the switch off. The other one's in the kitchen, on the top of the dresser. He put the walkie-talkie back under the floorboards. I use it to keep in touch with what's going down there in parent land. Good, eh? Brilliant, I said. But how is it going to help me? Use your brain, Jimbo, said Charlie, tapping his forehead. 
where you put one of the star from. Isn't that a bit risky? I said nervously. Things were bad enough already. If the teachers found me bugging their private conversations, I'd be marched out of the school gates and banged up in Venom before tea time. Of course it's risky, said Charlie, shrugging his shoulders. It wouldn't be fun if it wasn't risky. I was halfway down the rope ladder when a light came on. There was an ominous thump, and I looked up to see Charlie's mum looming out of the staircase window. She was carrying the cicadas she used for clipping her roses. Good evening, Jim. She smiled down at me. And what a pleasant evening it is. Uh, yes, I croaked. Very pleasant. Especially for climbing into people's houses uninvited, she tutted. Why, Jim? I might have thought you were a burglar, mightn't I? And if I had thought you were a burglar, heaven knows what might have happened. I clambered down the ladder for as fast as I could. It wasn't fast enough. And this is what I mean about the flamethrower temper. I've seen Charlie's mum throw a breadboard across the kitchen in an argument. She doesn't. She just doesn't operate according to the normal rules of being a grown-up. I was a couple of metres off the ground when she cut through one of the ropes of the ladder. I lost my footing and found myself dangling upside down. Then she cut the other rope and I hit the gravel, tearing the sleeve of my shirt and scraping the skin off my elbows. I ran for the front gate. I could hear her bellowing, Charlie, you get down here right now. I just hope she wasn't holding the breadboard. And that's the end of chapter two. So thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I'm sorry there was a bit of mistakes there. Um, you, but you know, we're not perfect. Anyway, I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode as much as you did last time. I forgot to mention at the beginning that the first video, it, it wasn't, it was more popular than I expected, actually. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I'm on my way to 30 subscribers already. So thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next episode for chapter three of Boom. Good night.